Shall we begin? Okay, I'm just going to introduce everybody. Um, I'm John T. Scuff. I'm a, I'm a curator for We Are Music Conference. Uh, I've been to Brazil many, many times. My 13th time to Brazil. Uh, I first started coming here with Camilo Rocha, who probably a lot of you know. Um, and I'm a big fan of your country, particularly the rain. Um, and um, what I do now, as well as doing curation for this, I curate for Amsterdam Dance Event uh, for five years. Uh, I'm also uh, Pioneer's kind of man in Berlin, effectively. I, I look after uh, DJ relations, club relations, and I train uh, DJs on some of the Pioneer uh, top-end equipment. Uh, I'm also a DJ producer. I'm also playing at The Edge on Sunday morning at 7.30, so if any of you are at The Edge, come and see me play. Then, so that's me. On my left, I have uh, Terry, never know how to pronounce your last name, pronounce your last name. We're a singer. We're a singer. Terry is uh, vice president of uh, Beatport, the SFX company. Uh, Terry lives in Berlin, a couple hundred meters from me. We never see each other in Berlin because Terry's always traveling. Uh, Terry also used to work for Native. He was uh, the marketing director of Native uh, for a number of years, uh, Native Instruments. And before that, he worked for Panasonic uh, when the turntables were still going, just when the turntables died, the Technics turntables. Uh, and tech before that, Terry worked for Pioneer for five years. So Terry's got loads of knowledge and stuff going back. On Terry's left, we have uh, Roland Lieske. Uh, Roland is the big boss of Get Physical. Um, Get Physical uh, recently has joined forces with um, A-Life, um, Artists Alive, uh, Loco Dices label. Uh, Chris Liebing's CLR label, and Roland kind of oversees the whole project, which I believe you've got 45 people in the office? Yeah, in the office it's 45, and um, try to count them. I think we have another seven freelancers around the world, yeah. Okay, so what Roland's doing in Berlin with Get Physical and CLR is very much running a, a, a very much new age business of uh, pooling of labels and doing lots of lots of interesting ways of being a DJ and being a producer. Uh, Mauro, Maurizio in the middle is um, ID and T now SFX man. Uh, Maurizio uh, is a brand expert. He used to work. He's a techno DJ as well. Uh, worked for some kind of regular jobs for quite a few years for some big blue chip kind of companies and is now uh, responsible for Tomorrowland's brand and various other. SFX brands in Brazil. So Mauro is a kind of an expert. Maurizio is an expert. And we're going to tap into your branding views. Next up we have Maria, who's uh, had a fortuitous uh, help from a guy on the street. She lost her glasses on the street in, in the storm. And a complete stranger found her glasses, held them, and just gave, it, gave them back to her as she was running around mean? on the street <laughs> looking for the glasses. So Maria's um, Warner's music dance person from Berlin. So she looks after Skrillex and uh, Breach and a whole bunch of artists. Uh, Oliver Hill, like uh, Skrillex, uh, you already told that, um, Timid, uh, Robin Schulz, all these guys. Uh, okay, and then last but not least, we have uh, John Berry. Uh, John is a Canadian, another Berlin-based uh, person. So we've got four Berlin people, five Berlin people, actually. So we're doing a Berlin panel tomorrow as well. Um, anyway, John was a hardcore punk uh, back in the day, living in New York, and uh, was working with uh, Napalm Death and people like that. And, uh, I'm a huge Sepultura fan. Can you do a Napalm Death microphone? <laughs> Maybe later. Maybe later. Okay, John, John works for Compact, and John is the A&R for Compact, along with Michael Meyer. He also manages Michael Meyer and uh, Ewan Pearson, and you're involved in a lot of the label management of how Compact is operating. Um, so we've got a, I'm, I'm talking a lot about what you all do. I want to throw some questions at you. Um, I mean, first question, today, I mean, just asking you in the crowd, how many of you in the crowd are DJs? Quite a lot of you, almost everybody. How many of you are producers? More producers. How many of you are producers and DJs? Okay, good. <laughs> good, good audience. So, um, 
today for somebody in the crowd, I, I'm a DJ producer too, and I'm, I need advice on what I should be doing. What are the, the key priorities? I mean, Roland, you're, you're looking after a whole selection of artists, you're advising people. Somebody comes in your office, you're going to sign them. What should they be spending their time doing today as a DJ producer wanting to do all the right things? Where, where is, what, what's the priorities? That's a very good question. Um, making good music, first of all. And then, you know, trying to find a way to um, stick to what you really like and what you stand for, follow the passion and not follow any trends which promise to give you the fast lane and the fast money. Um, I, I don't like to give advice actually because when, when we look at somebody um, at the stage when they come to us and ask us or if we ask them if we would like to work together, um, they have made a lot of steps already. Yeah, And um, it's like the same within the record industry when you get sent a tape to listen to, you know, none of the hits in the world have been really signed by a demo, maybe 1% out of 100%. So um, as a producer nowadays or in the days before, I think it's always about skills, quality, always trying to be better than the, the next day, challenge yourself. And then besides this, you really have to find a kind of, a, how do you say that in English, um, um, a companionship, a hood, a kind of a gang around you, helping you to struggle all through the different things which are so important, besides making very good music, yeah? Um, because nowadays you have to think about how to package yourself, how to represent yourself, how to say no to a lot of different things, and to f find your own style and then, you know, okay, try Okay, I'm going to go into these things a little bit in more detail with, with all of you. I mean, John, John Berry from Compact, you're selecting some of the A&R. Um, you're, you're, we have an artist friend in common, Patrice Bermel, who's a Dutch producer, he's a resident of Trap. Patrice is a, a very independent guy. Uh, he's got a very clear vision of what he wants to do. And I mean, for you, how, how are you selecting? How did you hook up with Patrice, for example? What made you think Patrice is a guy you can... Well, you know, we, we linked up with Patrice because he's been a long time resident of Trow, an old friend of Michael's, and, um, you know, just a great DJ. And uh, he's over the last, you know, we've been following his production over the last years, you know, supporting him. And obviously he's been supporting us by playing our music and that. And it was just a natural fit with the, the with, um, Trow's a club in Amsterdam that's going to be closing on January 3rd. And it's going to leave quite a rut in the Amsterdam scene, at least the scene that I'm involved in and that I'm working in. Um, and, you know, we wanted to support Patrice. Uh, we did a record this year, did really well. Um, you know, and he's just sending us great music. I'd, I'd like to say something, though, about um, the, the, the whole demo process just there. Yeah, the demo, yeah. Um, we, we listen to nearly everything that's sent to us. Um, we actually love to develop artists from ground zero and build them up. Um, we take a lot of pride in doing that. Uh, <coughs> Guy Barato was one of those guys who sent us a CD in the post, and uh, we wouldn't have found him, you know. Uh, ride from Cologne, Germany, and, uh, you know, we were really fortunate to get that CD, and uh, the, the relationship happened because of that. Um. So people, people in the crowd who are thinking, I want to be the next Ski Barato, yeah, yeah. should literally just send you a CD and they're in with a... Like, you know, it always helps to have a relationship. There are different variables, of course, like, you know, of, of, are you networked, are you playing shows, you know, but a lot of the time, we really consider music as music, um, and where we... we we of course like those bonuses that they're, you know, they're, they're, they have a community, they have a following in their local community. There's all these different variables that add up to a common result of, you know, making it more of a sensible thing to do. But it's really about the music for us at Compact, you know, it really is. I mean, moving on to you, Maurizio, to bring in your your position for your, you know, you're booking a lot of talent. You're you're boosting people's careers if you select somebody to headline one of your events or play a high-profile gig. Um, is, is DJing alone still viable? Are you looking at DJ? If somebody is only a great DJ, is that, would you still book someone? Or do the people need to be producing now to have a realistic chance, would you say? Well, it is viable, uh, but if you look at it separately, uh, you know, as a, 
as an independent activity without uh, producing any music, uh, you can only go so far. You know, uh, nowadays, uh, for you to really uh, position yourself among the top artists, uh, you have to produce uh, content, uh, be it uh, you know music, be it uh, a special performance. You have to be unique in some way, because uh, you know to to express uniqueness only by DJing is uh, something for really you know a really 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 small group of guys, like uh, for example Marky. That's one guy that can, you know, really stand out only as a DJ. But he also produces, but, you know, only his DJ is enough for him to, to stand out. Uh, but it's not the case for most of the people. Because how does, I mean, we, we talked about it in Amsterdam Dance Event. Roland, Roland spoke on about panels there, and we, Roland gave me the idea for the panel, which was death of downloads. And we were talking about the fact that it's harder and harder to make money as a producer. Um, how, how do your producers make money, Roland? I mean, what, what's, how does it work? Let's say you've got a producer who doesn't DJ, maybe. How, how does it do? You yeah, it depends. Yeah, as a, I mean, the question is very interesting because um, I ask myself, how did producers survive before the digital area? Because you didn't have the chance to reach an audience with just one click all over the world. Nowadays, you can really reach everybody at almost zero cost. Yeah, it doesn't cost you anything to get a you a little bit to set up a small computer laptop kind of producing unit but it's not really expensive compared to like when there wasn't any internet and all these things so I think the guys before us really knew how to survive and how did they because they were making very very good music and they were you know like really focusing on what they wanted to achieve and I think it's still the same nowadays you really have to focus on what you want to achieve and um, but the guys we are working with um, I think just one or two of them are real musicians like where I say um, hood up in German where you say respect they really know how to produce music they can do every kind of music they know how to read actually you know um, noten I don't know the English expression um, notation notations and everything so I think 98% of the guys we're working with are performers producers they know how to sell themselves and they know how to party and to gather a gang a crew around them and they make money through DJing of course yeah and the production is a tool to make them more prominent to promote themselves so when we talk to somebody um, who is still thinking about or do I, shall I copyright protect my music? We say, no, fuck it, uh, just give it away for free. Sharing is caring, and the more people listen to your music, the higher gets the chances that you are going to be booked as a DJ or as a live act, and then you are going to make money out of it, and that's wonderful, because then you can make a living. So you think not having legal contracts is, is not really important anymore? Uh, that's something else. <laughs> I mean, contracts are there for situations where you're getting into um, uh, into trouble. But uh, ideally, you do a contract, put it away, and never have to pull it out again. Because um, when you have a very good relationship, and our scene, although it is an international or a global scene, is still a very small one. And uh, just said it to Terry yesterday. You always meet twice, and uh, positions change. You're talking to a let's say a label manager at Beatport um, and I'm the label guy, I want him to give me a feature so I try to behave very well, upload everything in time, give all the information, everything you have to do and uh, but maybe he is um, um, being bought by a big uh, company from America and then he, you know, there's different things in the future so of course we always have to be nice, make good relationships and connect with each other and then, you know, <laughs> everything else, you know, so the contracts are just there for, for when you're on a very high level and where you have to make sure that everything is running t smooth but otherwise it's all about the personal relationship. Okay, Terry, bringing you into the conversation, your, your people, you're working with, you look after all the labor relationships. Struggling, people are not making money, but setting up their own. 
you'd recommend as a, a good move to? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, I think the game's changing, but when we talk about struggling, um, digital downloads as a whole fell by 2% last year. But actually for our industry, dance music went up by 8% last year. So actually last year, more dance music was sold than in any other year. So it's definitely on the, the path of a downward spiral because we are moving to a streaming model. Um, for the consumer at least, obviously the DJ is a very different thing. Uh, DJs won't be streaming for a little while longer. Um, but the label model is still a very valid one. And actually, you know, when you're talking about um, how do you market yourself as an artist, um, you've got a very good example here. I mean, Compact has a particular sound. Get Physical has a particular sound. And we're quite unique in dance music in our, in our need for labels. And, uh, you know, sending in the right track that is a compact track, you know, that's, it's got an identity to it. And we really, um, I think as a community, we believe in the sounds that we're producing. And that's something that the labels are really defined still. I mean, John, bringing in Guy, Guy Barato, obviously everyone in the crowd is aware of Guy Barato's success. I mean, when, when you had Guy Barato's CD as a, as a presumably quite unknown artist to you at that point, yeah. Was it, I mean, was it a question of just thinking this is a great CD, this is great music, that's enough to... Uh... No, um, well, I, I, I actually didn't sign Guy, Michael did. Um, but when he sent in the CDs, um, he, sent, he sent in the music, we had a subdivision label called K2 at the time, and uh, out of the whole batch, we found, like, one track that, I know Michael found one track that he really liked, and there was another one that needed development. And, and you know, they, they talked on the phone, and, you know, Guy's a very likable person, at least with us, and he's lovely, lovely. And Michael really, they immediately had, you know, a relationship. They were able to communicate easy, easy, easily with each other, which I think is an important thing as well when signing an artist, that there is a communication level. There's an understanding that, you know, we were, we're, we're always very careful about giving, you know, especially with Guy, giving him his creative freedom, but also making sure that it's something that we feel that we can release and we can sell. And uh, um, in that case, Guy's first two EPs didn't sell very well, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, we, it was, you know, they, it, but when he sent us and started working on Chromophobia, his first album for Compact, you know, we immediately heard something that was special. And obviously, that, the, the way the album evolved and, and the amount of, you know, it just didn't happen. Like, it was good music, and so it, he became big. He really worked hard and uh, spent a lot of time in Europe. He invested a lot of, a lot of money so into promoting himself. And, uh, and obviously, the music, when the album dropped, it, it, you know, it spoke for itself, and it elevated his career. Um, but, yeah, it, he, you know, he worked very hard to get to... To where he is now. How, how important is it now? I mean, Maria bringing you in, so you're, you're from Warner's Music, you're, you're working with quite a lot of independent acts and independent labels. And how important is it uh, for DJs, producers to be um, doing it themselves and building up Facebook, thousands of Facebook likes and Twitter and Instagram? I mean, is this, is this something they have to do now? Are, are you saying if they don't do this? Are you looking at their numbers and thinking they haven't got many fans? forget them? I mean, how important is this for...? Um, I this? think uh, it depends. <laughs> um, uh, for the major b scene, I think it is super important. I mean, we really work with this tool, with the social media channels. Like, it's not only, uh, not only Facebook, it's also Twitter and uh, Instagram. We, we, yeah, we develop uh, social media strategies. And there's a team behind an artist, if he's not doing hand uh, handling it uh, on his own, we are doing it. And uh, yeah, because we are using it as a, a platform to promote his music, to promote himself, to build a identity. Uh, if, yeah, I think it's, it's super important for us. But um, if it's not a major related artist, I mean, if you're good enough, you can also say, fuck you, like Ricardo Villalobos or whatever. You know, he, I, I think he still doesn't have a Facebook profile. I've, yeah, and he doesn't give a shit about it. So, and he's still successful. So, um, I think it depends. But for us, as we want to reach, uh, yeah, the world uh, with uh, our dance music, 
uh, I think it's, it's they are, we are talking about other figures, I think, so, yeah. Because there's a, there's a guy I uh, had on a panel called Oliver Luckett. Do you know Oliver Luckett? You come across him. Oliver Luckett is this guy, um, he's an American social media kind of guru. He used to work for Disney, and he's like this genius yeah, yeah. Uh, guy at basically getting you millions of Facebook followers. And, and he did Steve Aoki, yeah. and Steve Aoki hired him, yeah. and he basically doubled Steve Aoki's yeah. uh, statistics in yeah. about six months. Yeah. And they were real fans, so he did things. Yeah, yeah. I think Steve Aoki, he encouraged Steve Aoki to start doing things like he was chopping watermelons <laughs> and samurai sword. And cakes. And, and <laughs> cake thing, yeah. So I mean, uh, for you guys, I mean, Roland, are you encouraging Mandy to start throwing cakes at people? Or what's your, <laughs> what's your take on cake throwing? Uh, Is this a good, good idea? Um, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> Actually, we try to keep them away from doing things like that. <laughs> because you don't have to teach them, you know. And then uh, everybody likes to freak out, of course, in our scene at least. But um, yes, we are having conversations about how do you present yourself and what do you not do? Um, uh, how do you look like? How do you represent yourself with your um, releases, with your looks, what do you wear, um, what kind of remixes do you choose for your next record, um, how do you want to achieve the next level, and things like that every day, that's our job, yes. And, um, um, okay, I want to I yeah. ask you for a story, because I have to say, Tales of Us, I knew nothing about Tales of Us, you know, until quite recently, and they, they just completely passed me by. As a, as, a, as a duo that, Terry was horrified when I told him this, but they just, they just didn't register with my world or music. And now they're number two in Resident Advisor, top 100, and they're kind of super successful guys. And how did you take Tales of Us to number two in Resident Advisor? Was it just a kind of, they, they, just the music's great and they've got a big gang of friends? Or what, how much actual strategy is involved in that? Well, it wasn't us. It's been them, yeah? For Tale of Us, we are only the booking agent. They don't have a management. Um, they manage themselves, and um, they are very, very, very clever, yeah? First of all, they have a good, good knowledge of music. They kind of grew up in the club called DC10 in Ibiza. I think they've been there they, since they're like little like that and they absorb the music, they listen to I don't know how many hours of DJ sets. They've seen it all, they, they, they've seen how people reacted to music, you know, when they were on drugs and everything, so they kind of, you know, took it from the breast of their mother, so to say. So they have a good knowledge. Um, secondly, um, they know exactly what they are doing. They um, have, um, they're producing very, very good music. Um, and they know how to sell themselves. The artwork is looking good. The guys look very good. The way they, they are dressed and they have a complete gang of people around them who are supporting them. If they are discussing an artwork, it's like, you know, like the, when we had this, this panel here with all the women, when they were talking, like five women at the same time. You know, imagine them, but times 10. So it's like they really are into it and they know what they are doing and they know exactly what they are not doing as well. Um, and they have a gang, of course, they started doing their own parties, they started doing their own releases on their own label uh, with Life and Death in Italy and um, it's, I think it's the best advice you can, you can give, you know, why do you wait for somebody else? Just start creating your own um, parties, release your own music, do your own record label, think about what you really think is great looking and what kind of style you like and so that's the way they achieved it. And the most important thing here is they had a chance and they took it, yeah? They really were ready to kill for it because in, I don't know how it is in Brazil at the moment, but in Europe we had um, kind of, uh, how do you say that? Um, every DJ was playing the, the same music. It was minimal music or some people called it tech house. It sounded like, yeah, may maybe 24 hours almost the same sound. If you're not into this music, it all sounded the same and you had to take a lot of drugs to, you know, <laughs> like it and uh, you didn't really see a lot of good looking women at the dance floor at this time, yeah? And then these guys came, you know, took away all the speed of the music, 
brought vocals back onto the dance floor, real vocals and uh, emotion. So when you go to a set from those guys, you can close your eyes and let yourself go. You can dream, you can even cry and you have good looking girls all over the dance floor and th this makes a big difference of course. Yeah, And uh, they are not afraid to um, you know, jump between genres. They use pop music influences, rock music influences, and they use vocals. And that was at the right time. And, you know, yeah, they took the chance. Okay. Um, manage management, Roland, you, your company also manages a lot of DJs in a lot of different ways. You, you manage uh, Marcel Detman and all, all, all sorts of interesting yeah um well i'm uh, i'm a shareholder of a company which we just founded and we merged companies so um get physical is only a little part of this and we the, the girls and boys from get physical are doing the label management team but we have uh, an artist management company and booking agency and we are doing our own events with an events agency and it's all you know, hold together by um, a company which holds the shares in all the companies and finances this. And um, it was the right move to do because we just wanted to join our forces and to enable everybody to concentrate on what he or she is best at. And uh, yeah, management-wise, we are doing Loco Dice, Chris Liebing, Marcel Detman, Guti, Tini and the gang, and a lot of others, yes. So I want to ask Maurizio, when you're dealing with people, again, the question of should DJs, producers, aspire to have a manager these days would you do you take people more seriously with a manager i mean for, for all you guys i think that a, a manager can bring a, a more professional approach uh, and a more structured approach to the development of an artist's career but before all that i think that uh, the first thing that an artist should uh, ask himself is uh, what do i stand for as roland said uh, after that is uh, what is my goal where do I want to be in the future you know what do I want to reach with this career because it's not the same for everyone okay you have to make a lot of choices a lot of hard choices and you have to work your ass off lose your sense of entitlement you know it's n it's of no use for any artist. you have to earn your space nobody will give you your space you know, and, uh, and then after that, you have to ask yourself, how do you want to get there? Is it with a, a special performance? Is it with uh, special collaborations? Uh, you know, you have to find your way. And, uh, and then a manager can help you uh, with these choices, you know, with the how, but not the why. The why has to be defined by the artist himself. And how do, you, how do you find a manager? So let's say, let's say, John, I decide I want you to be my manager. Do I just like send you an email and say, please be my manager? Is it? Yeah. Um. And how much do you cost? <laughs> I'm not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what you just said was invaluable advice. You know, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of the times when, if I'm approached by someone and they say, hey, I want you to manage me, I'm, the first question I ask is like, what do you need a manager for? You know, and I, I need a clear answer from them in order for me to have any sort of belief in that I can do a job for them. Because at the end of the day, I can represent the artist, but I'm not going to brand the artist myself or develop or turn him into the next big DJ by changing him. You know, that does happen in this industry, but I work for a more, in, I guess, you know, we we're quite independent and very integral about allowing our artists to have their own beliefs and their own choices. Um, there's a lot of times, <clears throat> but for me, I, as I'm, I, I, because I work at Compact, I'm not as adventurous about going out and finding and developing a large roster of artists that I want to manage. Um, I don't feel it's necessary, for at least at this stage. What, what do you actually do as a manager? What is, uh, you just phone people up and... Change diapers. Jack up the price and... Change a lot of diapers. <laughs> get, get the DJ's drugs. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a lot to do, like for me, a lot of my work structure. Um, it's a lot about using my network uh, to try and develop the artists um, through the people that I know. Um, it's about 
making their dreams come true and looking at it in a realistic way, but literally looking at making a dream become a reality and doing my best to make that happen. Um, a lot of my day to day is though a lot of structure, it's a lot of social media development, uh, brand development, um, which means uh, potential partnering with different companies and developing the artist um, and dealing with promoters, bookers, booking agents, and uh, in the case of Ewan Pearson, I to handle his production management, so a lot of it is a lot to do with looking at the art, like he, he's, a, he's a, a musician, he's an electronic music producer, he's a remixer, but he also produces bands in the studio. So a lot of that work is involved with dealing with the bands, getting a relationship going with them, finding out what they really need, and if they're not represented by management, a lot of work that I'll be doing with them is kind of trying to achieve the goals that they want to make in the studio with recording the album in as short a period of time and as, as under budget as possible. How, how do you all deal with uh, people's egos? I mean, somebody gets super successful, surrounded by new friends, girls, whatever, drugs, <coughs> somehow? Buy them more drugs. <laughs> no. I mean, Roland, uh, Roland, are you a kind of a, a role model saying, guys, don't do that, be like me, be straight edge, and is that, is that your way, or? How do you handle this, keeping your artists on the straight and now, and not fucking up and not? You know what, the funny thing is, um, the artists which I have met which are really successful or which became very successful later, they really are very focused and um, they've seen all the shit already and they know what it costs themselves if they let themselves go. They are really, as you've said, it has to come from themselves. You know, I cannot tell them not to do any bad things. Yeah, but I'm... I'm I'm, I'm now in an age where I certainly will do, you know, I can be, I can be very frank and um, I will close the door before I start talking, but usually if I stop talking then it's getting dangerous. And so, you know, and I have a very good setup of partners, so we, ex you know, I don't have to do it all myself, you know, one guy is closer with this artist, the other is closer with this artist and it's very important not to, um, you know, as the manager, I'm not the artist, so I'm just trying to help in the background and we are setting up a whole team of people around it and then um, it's always the decision of the person to make the best out of it or not, yeah. It's very easy, I think, and, but when you're on a certain level where you're traveling um, around the globe all the time, then you certainly do not like to do any drugs or just a little bit, maybe once in a while, because otherwise you will not be able to um, follow up to your schedule. It's like uh, like a professional soccer or football player. It's the same game, yeah? I mean, those guys are flying more air miles than the captains of the huge airlines are, yeah? <laughs> so you really have to be focused if you want to play this game. And, you know, and if, if you are focused enough to get there, I don't have to tell it's more like you to enable the person to for him or person in getting there. How do you handle uh, an artist who maybe loses inspiration? Let's say, for example, the minimal, the minimal thing where minimal everyone was producing minimal, and then the minimal scene became tech house essentially. I mean, somebody who's who was still making minimal. How, how do you cope with somebody? who slips out of fashion or uh, I remember I, I was an Electro Clash DJ originally and the Electro Clash scene just completely died everywhere. I, I, was, I came to Brazil to play Electro Clash the first couple of times and then all the Electro Clash clubs died basically. I mean, how do you cope with uh, this well, like, kind of situation? I think, I think, you know, a lot of artists at the end of the day, you know, it really also kind of ties into the ego as well. Like artists kind of evolve, they, they develop, they often, try to challenge themselves by pushing themselves musically and that often creates the trends in the music that, you know, that dictate what, you know, whether this minimal tech house scene being evolved into, you know, romantic techno or melodic house or whatever we call it today, you know, that, 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 that was just an evolvement of a necessity because yes, it was fucking stagnant for a while there and, you know, unfortunately we for good or bad, there's an incredible amount of dance music that's released every week. 
I think I was talking to someone at Bport. I'm tr I was trying to remember just now, but I think it's 13,000 tracks a week that are released on Bport. Am yes, I right? 25,000. Oh, Christ. On average. You know, that's a fucking depressing number, and it's pretty fucking discouraging, you know? And at the end of the day, that, that gives you as a producer all the more reason to step up and challenge yourself. And it's, it's not necessarily those people that make the music that sounds and fits in with the rest of it, at least in the music that I work in. This is, this is what I'm, the, the community that I'm working in or whatever. Um, but it's those people that take what's going on in the current scene and do something original and something different with it and, 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 and embrace it. And you know, like talking about Tale of Us because we handle the life and death label. Um, you know, they, they, you know, they, they, they came up in the scene and they were, they, 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 they brought these like insane sub bass frequencies into their music. It wasn't vocals at all. It was more to do with the production. And they, 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 they just twisted the sound. It wasn't really unique, but it was something different. And, and DJs gravitated to it and they started playing it. And, and, and that, that's, you know, the reason for the success. Uh, Guy Barato, he, he, you know, he took kind of our classic compact sound, which is a very melodic, poppy, uh, you know, kind of 125, 123, 125 BPM kind of roller. And he, he turned, you know, he utilized a lot of his experience as, a, as an engineer, uh, because he used to produce and engineer mixed bands. And he kind of took that and took his love for 80s pop music and, and, and created songs, you know, in a sense. And that really affected people, like the, the, the single Beautiful Life that he did was a, a massive hit for us. And it, it, it uh, you know, and it resonated uh, something that worked on the dance floor, but it also resonated something that you could do in life, you know, and you could listen to on the train or in the office or, you know, in a fucking cafe, you know. Uh, it, 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 and that, that's, I think, the essence of how the cream rises to the top, you know? Um, even, in, even in commercial music, like we, we have an artist, Kolsch, um, who is also known as a famous EDM producer, Rune R.K. And, you know, he, he, it's funny Kolsch, talking Kolsch, to him because- Kolsch is I, an EDM producer, did you say? Well, he, was Rune R, he is Rune R.K. Uh, and he's also produced Nervo. Um, he's, he's produced Nervo. a number of big hits. Uh, he also yeah. won the cook-off at ADU. Exactly, and yeah. he's a great chef. Great he, chef. Yeah, but, um, you know, I was talking to him and I was just like, man, like, how do you make this crap? And, and he's just like, and, you know, I was like, it, you know, the reason why I love making that kind of music is because it's incredibly hard to make it. And I was like, bullshit. And he's just like, no, you don't know how hard it is to make a track like that and make it sound a little different than the rest. You may not think it's different, but everyone else out there does. And he's like, it, it's an incredible challenge to make, because there is a bit of a formula involved in it, but it, there's also a uniqueness of how it affects you as a, as a fan and on the dance floor. Uh, you, you affect it Exactly, by authenticism, yeah. So for you guys, do you, do you think Avicii is a, a genius producer, all of you? Are you would you I, see a talent there, special talent? I, 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 I really think his music's crap. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, like, it, it, you know, like, great, I worked with a bluegrass country dude and put a fucking beat behind it. And, like, I think, I think it works. You know, I think it is, there's definitely something really good about it. It's just, you know, I think, I think it's more the, the fact that, they, that, yes, he's a producer, but then he has this gigantic team of people, and he's he become, like, from what I can see, at least, because I have never worked with him and I've never spoken with him, but I know a bit about the background of him, I find it a bit weird that he has to have this team, this gigantic team pushing him and pushing him. And you know, he's, he's had issues with exhaustion and overworkedness, being overworked. And, and, and I, I feel kind of sorry for the guy in a sense at the end of the day, because he's almost being puppeted around. And it, it, that, that, uh, that application of, you know, like the Mickey Mouse Club, Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake thing is almost being applied into the formula of dance music and and it's an unfortunate consequence you know because there are other alternatives you know like skrillex you know i was going to think about skrillex yeah maria you know i got a lot of respect for him you know how does how does it work with skrillex to see is he uh is skrillex doing 25 interviews a day how, how, how does it work when you're working with skrillex is he is he a kind of a free agent who turns up in the office or? i mean yeah he's um he's he does what he wants. <laughs> so 
sometimes uh, he's super professional in the first place. That's, he's super, super professional. Um, he's surrounded by the right people. He's choosing his team. He says um, stopped, to, uh, so I, I uh, take a break um, for like two months. I don't do anything. Um, but as soon as he's back, he's uh, producing hits. <laughs> you know, on um, yeah. Con constantly hits and I think what you, what you said it's not only uh, I think about uh, Avicii and the music and this I think personally it's crap mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, there is an audience and it's the huge uh, it's a huge audience so it's not only you know, the, the music and the guys and the EDM scene it's it's actually the biggest audience for EDM so I don't know I'm I think, I think the big, the big, oh, sorry. I think the big difference between Avicii and Skrillex is that Skrillex, I, I, I know the girl over at Big Beat who was really deeply involved in developing Skrillex and like he's never needed to have blimps in the sky with his name on it or trucks with his name on it and, or hotels named after him. All this like, and all the spending, he's just run it with his fans from day one. He's used his social network. They don't really spend a lot of money marketing Skrillex. They literally put it, he, they let him do it on his social media. He puts his videos, his, uh, videos out his own way. He runs his own show. And that, there's a lot to say about the, the aspect of social media and commercial integrity. I think we're out Sorry. of time. So You're let totally me, right. <laughs> let me throw out questions from the crowd. Is anyone, in, any questions in the crowd to our fine panelists? Anybody? Chap over there. Can you shout? <laughs> too many drugs. I think too much techno is corrupt your mind or something. Well, uh, how do you guys find new artists? It only matters good music, well produced, or matters his presence at stage? Does it matter if it's if it is a live set or a live PA? How do you guys find new artists? And when you find, how do you achieve to them? And how do you get closer to them? Roland, I mean, you, you said it's through your networks, basically, right? Yeah, it's a network thing, of course. Um, we have, um, it's, it's actually, I just answered myself, this, I try to answer this question at the end of every year again. I have a big plan and we have a map of people who are working together with us. And basically, it's the DJs we are working with because they are traveling and they are meeting other producers all the time. So they really know the new music before it's being released and they exchange with each other and they kind of um, know what's happening, of course, naturally. Yeah? And I try to use that knowledge and to put it into a kind of a systematic way where we have um, different uh, um, roles and responsibilities and I try to steer them into a direction. Yeah, So um, there, is, um, there is a system behind it and sometimes it pays off and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you always have to find a good mixture, I think, between young, fresh talents where you think they can develop into something, but on the other day you have to make a day-to-day -day business to pay your people who are working for you. So ideally you have some um, producers which are like very well known already where you know if they produce something it's going to reach an audience and you can make some money out of it and then you can use kind of a little bit of this money to invest into new even to think about um, different people, but I'm trying to think about more of genres and things which you can now re-release because our music is, I think it's about 40 years old now, electronic music. It's like uh, uh, almost older than lots of different sorts of other music and it's still, you know, um, developing every day. So I think you have like six generations of clubbers now or even seven or eight generations of clubbers now and if you play uh, a young kid which is 19, 20 years old, a record from, let's say, 1995, uh, maybe this kid will say, wow, it's amazing, I never heard this, but it sounds like a lot of the stuff the young kids are producing, so you can take an old guy like a DJ Pierre and re-release his music, give it to a new audience, and you know, that's, that's the job, to try to find a balance between these things, but uh, everybody has a different approach, of course, and 
Um, sometimes it's really funny because sometimes I just get tipped off by somebody who has nothing to do with the business and then I just write an email to the artist and they always reply. And then it's about, you know, finding a personal relationship, yeah? And if you have the good vibrations, everything else can happen. You know? I think it's all about connections. In fact, all these guys are all here in Sao Paulo to meet people. So if you've got music, definitely the next few days I would be going up to these people and chatting to them. And uh, this, yeah. this is how it works. ADE is exactly like this. I mean, John, for you, oh, sorry, Maria. I wanted to say something, yeah, because um, um, uh, for Warner Music, uh, we uh, have also different models uh, to find new acts, to sign new acts. For example, like we have a super, super young artist called Ethnic, um, and uh, he's like 21, and we signed him uh, straight out of his, uh, after his first DJ gig. <laughs> um, it was at a club in Hamburg, Balsal, and he had his, really, his first DJ gig. He was 19, and we signed him straight after, because he was such a great person. It was such a great set, it was a proper techno set. And he was su he's such a personality, he's super, super cute and um, yeah, uh, great character and we signed him like, like that. And we also do signs uh, via SoundCloud. If you upload a track and it got viral and, I don't know, got one million clicks uh, in place, um, there is for sure a team finding you, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so yeah. it's also happening like that. I mean, you don't... You don't really need a network. It happens everywhere. I just need to be fine. Okay, we have to stop because we're running very late. And John, John is going to be speaking tomorrow on the Berlin panel. So we'll toss some stuff in on that. So uh, thank you all very much for speaking.